I think that's a terrible decision. Yeah, terrible. Yeah, terrible. Exactly. It's awful. Hey, don't do that. Don't do that. Hey, y'all. It's LJ here, owner and founder of Smart Moms Plan Disney and Smart Moms Travel. We are so glad you're here for another episode of the Smart Moms Plan Disney podcast. Now, here's your host, Allie. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Smart Moms Plan Disney podcast. I am your host, Allie, joined today by Becky and Stacy. Good morning, girls. Good morning. Hi, friends. I am smiling so big because today's topic is something I feel very passionately about. We are so, so glad that you are all here to listen. If you're listening to this episode automatically loaded into your device, it dropped in overnight. We just want to say thank you so much. That means you are a subscriber and you have no idea how grateful we are for all of you that have already taken that step. It really, truly helps us. And if you would like to support our podcast and help it reach the ears of other Disney loving moms, it doesn't have to cost a thing at all. Just stop what you're doing. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Take a second. Leave us a five star review. Five stars. And uh, it means so much to us. It helps us grow this podcast and guarantees that we can continue to create this content and help families just like yours get to Disney in the most realistic and beneficial way for their family. Recently, our listener, Samantha underscore Danielle 28, left us a five-star review and said, this podcast helps bring all the smart mom tactics to life. I love that you are able to hear so many different viewpoints from moms of all ages. And isn't that the truth? We have a lot of ages (laughs) among us and we all work for this awesome travel agency, Smart Moms Travel. We have so many helpful tips. But sometimes it is difficult to get all of that information to families that want to travel to Disney in a really good way. This podcast has allowed us to really create a vault of helpful information so that's always there, ready to access when you need it. So thank you so much. For today, we are talking about something that we as travel agents, as people that go to Disney a lot, we get asked all the time, should I add a park hopper? to my vacation package or my Disney World tickets. I I mean, I probably have that conversation with every single person I talk to about Disney. Would you guys agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it comes up often. To be honest with our our fans, it's it doesn't make sense at all times, but it definitely makes sense a lot of time. So we don't have a Blake and answer. And it's kind of what we're going to dive into today in why it might make sense for your family and it might not make sense for your family. Yeah, it's not. I like what you touched on there. It is not a necessity for every single guest and every single vacation and every single itinerary. It's just not. So Disney has base tickets and park hopper tickets and then variations that would include water parks. The base ticket allows you to go to one park per day. Disney World has four major theme parks, Magic Kingdom, Epcot, Hollywood Studios, and Animal Kingdom. And with a base ticket, you go to one of those parks each day. If you have a four-day ticket, you have four separate days to go to one park per day. Pretty simple. A lot of people choose to add that four-day base ticket so they get that access to one park per day and they get to see all four parks and experience all four, and that's great. But the park hopper option is an easy upgrade and it allows you to start in one park but visit any and all of the parks through your throughout your day. So you could essentially start at Magic Kingdom and then you could hop on over to Epcot and then you could hop all over to Hollywood Studios. You could really play with it based on transportation and things you want to see and do. And so it's really going to be how you're accessing more than one park per day. I also think that with the change of the timing that we no longer have to wait till 2 p.m. to be hopping, it also increases the value of a park hopper. Yeah, for those of you that may not know, when Disney World reopened a few years ago after they were shut down, there were some restrictions on park hopping for many years, you know, for a couple of years. It's only been recently that, so when when Disney World reopened, they had restrictions, you had to wait till 2 p.m. to hop, and that lasted for three plus years. And now that's been taken away. So now you have freedom in your hopping. You can, as long as you've scanned in to one park and it really busts 
blasts your day wide open, right? It's a world of opportunity at that point. Absolutely. The freedom and the opportunity that that provides is just, it just really does make this a valuable add-on to your ticket. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to, again, talk about the benefits and why you might want to consider this. And then on the back half of the episode, we're going to talk about the extreme park hopping which would be something that really avid Disney goers or people that are down the Disney rabbit hole may know about, which is called the four park challenge. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is and how to accomplish it. My family recently did it. And so I'm excited to break that down and discuss that on the back half of the episode. But for now, I don't always look at the park hopper as, do I need this? You know, a lot of families will say, well, I don't need that, or we're only going to want to see one park per day, or I don't want to make my kids too exhausted, right? It just seems like too much. I don't think we'll want to leave. And there is some good thinking there. Once you get to a park, you kind of want to set up camp for the day. Like this is my environment for the day. This is where we're going to be. We're going to take our time and go with the flow. And I completely get that sentiment, especially when my little kids were younger and I didn't know quite as much. I kind of shared that. And now I really, I really disagree with it because I look at the park hopper a little differently. But what about you all? I mean, do you think it's ever a necessity or what does it look like for certain families and vacations? I I think that I'm more easily okay with clients coming through without a park hopper if it's their first time at 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 Disney World at all. I do think, like you said, just set up camp. You have your one day in a park to just explore and spend an entire day there without having to strategize too much about what time to, to switch parks and to take that time for transportation. I do think that it definitely can be totally fine for a first timer. With family, you have larger groups and you just want to get somewhere and stay. Um, I'm okay with that. I don't, I don't have a problem with that at all. I, I particularly like to use Park Hopper if you have less days but you want to see everything. I know that it's very possible to see all four parks with three days of park tickets. If you have a park hopper, you can definitely work some things out. I, I will often encourage that even with first timers. You like having a park hopper on a shorter so you can hit multiple parks in multiple days. And I kind of see the flip side of that. I actually think that the best value of a park hopper is if you're adding it to a longer day worth of tickets because the cost of the park hopper is getting spread out. So we can't really pin down the cost of the park hopper, right? Because it's going to be different for different types of tickets. But typically you're looking around 60 to $90 per person to add a park hopper, whether you're adding it to a one-day ticket or to a 10-day ticket. And so if it's costing $90 to add a park hopper to a 10-day ticket, that's only adding $9 per day to the cost of your ticket. Disney knows how to play the game really, really well at getting the value, especially at keeping you on property. And so I think a lot of people overlook ticket in general If you're looking at a Disney three-day or four-day ticket, adding a fifth day to your ticket is so minimal to add that fifth day. And then it brings down the cost of the cost per day for that ticket. And it's the same thing for Park Hopper. It's so much more affordable cost per day wise when you're adding it to a longer ticket. I was just talking to a family. They're traveling next week, actually. And they texted me yesterday and they said, What if we add a park hopper? How much will it be? They're a family of four. They have three park days. I was like, oh, yeah, let's check that out. And it was, how much do you think it was to upgrade to the park hopper? I don't know. (laughs) For their package total, it was $350 to add it. Oh. I think that's kind of a no-brainer. I think they were shocked by that as well. It gave them multi-day, multi-park access across multiple days for multiple people. It's a huge value in there. And and now they're going to get a lot more freedom. This is something that's very important. And then I have a question again for all of you. One important thing to note, if you have booked a Disney World package or even just your tickets alone outside of the package, the park hopper does have to be added to every single day. Okay. So if you have a three-day ticket, you can't say, well, I just want to hop that one day because Animal Kingdom and Epcot are half-day parks, which false. (laughs) but you can't do that. It has to be for the entire ticket, but it actually is better because I've priced it where it's like, well, what if we did the ticket separately and you did one day hopper and two day base? It's actually more expensive than just doing the three day hopper. So don't ever let that deter you. You feel sometimes like you're losing if you only plan to hop once, but ultimately I think you're getting a good value. 
And Disney also has that Park Hopper Plus ticket, but that is when you get access to the water parks in your ticket. But with the free water park day that you're going to get on your vacation in 2025, I'm wondering what's going to happen with that ticket. Like, are very many people going to want to add it? So let's say you have a base ticket. And it's your first vacation. You've never been to Disney World and you're there. One of us was your travel agent and we've been talking up happily ever after the fireworks at Magic Kingdom. And oh my gosh, this show, you're going to hold baby so tight. You're going to sob and cry your eyes out because the show is so beautiful. It's going to be the best part of your trip. There's a big surprise at the end of the show. That's just like the most magical moment. And then it rains. And it's your one and only trip. It's your first trip. You're at Magic Kingdom and it rains. And you get that notification across your My Disney Experience app that Happily Ever After will not be showing tonight. What are you going to do? Cry. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> this is exactly that add-on situation where you might be pinching pennies and thinking, I know we're only going to do one park per day. Everything will be fine. We have our schedule completely itineraried out. We know exactly what we're going to be riding at exactly what time of day. We don't need the park hopper. And then this scenario arrives. And man, you're going to wish you had that park hopper. <laughs> and I think this is, an, a, this is just the perfect example. Missing a parade. Missing fireworks show. Missing a ride. Maybe, you know, Rise of the Resistance was down all day on your, par on your Hollywood Studios day. You're a huge Star Wars geeks. And... You missed your one day for it. So I think that's a perfect example of why, even if you don't plan to just do a really highly strategic park hop, you know, you're not going to do that park hop challenge. Um, and you might think you don't need it, but this is exactly why you should consider it. Yeah, I'm coming from a place of you don't need the park hopper to make your vacation magical. You can have that planned out itinerary and you can have the perfect one park per day. But for not much extra, you can also have a preventative that's going to ensure you have the best trip you can. I have a crazy little story about one of my very first trips to Disney. Um, Sean and I were still pretty newlywed. We didn't have kids yet. And I being the like, I'm going to save every penny that I can person, we had that exact thing happen. We were at Disney World, except it wasn't happily ever, ever after. It was Fantasmic, which is where my heart song is. And it got rained out on our, our Hollywood Studios day. And I was devastated. So I was like, how can I get there? Well, we're going to Epcot tomorrow. Let's just add an extra day to our ticket. And so I added an extra day to our ticket because it was like 10 bucks or like 20 bucks per person to add an extra day to our, our five day ticket so that we could go back to Hollywood Studios. And I was like, I'm just going to use a second day, the second half of the day to go there. And I show up at the gate to try to scan in. And I'm like, I still have an extra day. They're like, you can only use one day per day. So you cannot buy extra days and use two days worth of tickets on one day, which I thought I was being so smart and outsmarting <laughs> the system. Oh, I said goodness. the only way to go to two parks in one day is to have the park hopper. You thought two days could be scanned in at the I same seriously time. thought that. I was, I was naive <laughs> and not a Disney expert yet. I was a Disneyland girl living in a Disney World world at the moment. And that's funny. I don't know what I was thinking that Disney was not going to realize that people would think that they could do that. But no, you have to have the park hopper and just invest in it from the beginning. So you have that freedom for your entire trip. Yeah. And to be clear, I'm saying that the hopper would be preventative if it's not if you're still not understanding why the pop the park hopper is important here is because if that were to happen, which it does, it happens, you know, and I'm. I am a person that says it's going to rain on your vacation. Just go like, it's fine. You know, go dance and splash in the puddles, bring a extra pair of shoes and make, you know, you can have a great time. I am not by any means a person that says rain will ruin your vacation. But if rain takes happily ever after from you, if you have a park hopper, then no matter where you're planning on going the next day, you can hop back to Magic Kingdom, even just like 30 minutes before fireworks, you know, and you can see that show. And then you can hop back elsewhere if there's another park that's open late. So you're guaranteed that at one time or another on your trip, you're going to see that show because it's not going to get rained out, you know, several nights in a row. That just doesn't typically happen. And, you know, I'm not trying to scare people. I'm just trying to express that you do gain that flexibility and that exhale. First trips come with a whole lot of anxiety and pressure. I have to get it perfect for my kids. We have to see and do every single thing. And that brings up another really good point. What if 
you go to Magic Kingdom on your Magic Kingdom day and you drill through that itinerary, our itinerary, the podcast Magic Kingdom itinerary that we have, and you are nailing it. You're just going through, but the day is coming to an end and you know, you still haven't ridden three of those things that your kids wanted to ride. And this was your one and only Magic Kingdom day. You may never be back. And there just wasn't time to do it all. What if you get to Animal Kingdom and the kids don't love the animals as much as you thought they might? And you don't need to stay there all day, but oh, we really want to go back because we loved Hollywood Studios more than we ever thought we would. These are those game day decisions while you're on the vacation where you can let your experiences guide your experiences. Yeah. And I also love, I love that take on it. I also love the idea that I am a nighttime spectacular person. Happily ever after. Fantasmic. I want to end every single one of my Disney days with fireworks and Disney magic because it just doesn't get more magical than those those shows. And so on your Animal Kingdom day, you're going to be done dinner time, right? Dinner time is the end of your day. Go back to your resort, take it easy. And then a couple hours later, if a couple of your people in your party want to go and end with fireworks, then you can go over to Magic Kingdom or Hollywood Studios and end your day in just that way. It gives you so much freedom. Yeah, I don't recommend going back to Epcot and finishing there because I don't like that show. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's definitely a, a love or hate relationship with the new show. I'm with you though, Allie. I, you know, I, I listened to when you spoke about it, you and Katie, the other episode, and I was right there with you. I, we actually saw Luminous together. Yeah, I was I so disappointed as well. I was so excited to see Luminous. And see, yeah, I think I already mentioned once before, Stacey and I saw it together. And it was actually on my four-part challenge day, which we're going to talk about here on the back half of the episode. And yeah, big disappointment for me. I just, I would just use my hopper to hop back to Magic Kingdom in that case and <laughs> see a better show. True. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I, for me, it's not about you need the park hopper to make your trip happen and make it great. You need the park hopper to see and do everything. You really don't. But the park hopper adds a layer of exhaling where, you know, if you don't get to it today, there's always tomorrow. You know, if something doesn't go as planned, you can change course. You know that if your kids really loved Galaxy's Edge and you just want to, you know, that first Hollywood Studios day, maybe you're just pedal to the metal. We have to see, do and experience everything. And then the next day you're like, man, my kids really just want to hang out in Hollywood studios and they want, maybe they built a droid and they just want to like remote their droid all over galaxy's edge and find the little secret things and talk to other droids. And maybe you want to spend two hours doing that. And you can, because you have the flexibility to go back in. And to me, it makes it really, really worth it. You know, if you really are pinching pennies and you need to cut corners, obviously this is a smart place to look, but if you have the flexibility, it's usually not much more to give yourself that freedom. Another place to consider where a park hopper may be a huge benefit for your family is things like deluxe magic hours and the special events, especially if there's a, a special event happening at like Magic Kingdom. There's Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party happening at night. You would be surprised how low the attendance is during the day on those days because so many people who have one park per day tickets do not want to spend their day at a day that's going to end early. And so you could start your day in Magic Kingdom, have those lower crowds during the day before the special event, and then hop to another park after Magic Kingdom closes. That's such a good use of it, as well as those deluxe after or magic hours. If you're staying at a deluxe resort, getting to hop over to Epcot or Magic Kingdom and take in the most valuable time. Oh my gosh, ladies, is there anything more magical than our deluxe magic hours experiences? Love them. No, nothing. Yes, we've done three together, I think. We've been in Epcot and Magic Kingdom, which are the two that are typically on the schedule for deluxe after hours. But also we had an experience where Hollywood Studios was randomly on the schedule back in September, which was so exciting. So you have to make sure that if you are staying at a, a deluxe resort, you have to make sure you or your tra- you have your travel agent monitor the park hours and ask because you never know. We had a pop-up deluxe after hours at Hollywood Studios that we did not expect. It was so cool, so much fun because it's an atypical one. You know, normally the deluxe after hours schedule is typically Epcot on Mondays and Magic Kingdom on Wednesdays. And what happens is those parks stay open two hours past close for anyone staying in a deluxe resort. And when I tell you, you can see and do like the entire park in those two hours, I'm barely exaggerating. I mean, you can do so much in that time. 
And Becky, you're exactly right. I mean, you can show up if the park closes at 9 p.m. and you have a park hopper. Let's say Epcot closes at 9 o'clock. That means deluxe after hours are going to go till 11. And we've even seen deluxe hours go till 1 a.m. You're not going to want to have, you know, rope dropped and stay till 1 a.m. at the same park. And maybe you take a midday break in there, but like you're going to probably want a change of scenery. So starting elsewhere, taking a midday break and showing up in your after hours park, you know, half an hour before close is a really fun way to experience that. Absolutely. And it also opens up your dining opportunities. We've all talked about how Magic Kingdom is not necessarily our our favorite place to grab a, a sit down meal. And when you have this park hopping opportunity, you can hop on a monorail, go eat somewhere else, go hop over to, to Epcot. If you're at Epcot, you've got the, the Skyliner. You can take a ride over to Hollywood Studios and vice versa. Like It just really does add some flexibility into your whole vacation. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great, great little add-on. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the four-park challenge, what it is, how to maximize it, and how you can make it happen on your Disney bucket list. Because I think everybody has a Disney bucket list, right? (laughs) Are you a dedicated fan of the Smart Moms Plan Disney podcast and feel the need to take notes while listening to each and every episode? Our Diamond Mind Patreon subscription is a perfect fit for you. Every month, our Diamond Mind subscribers receive a new Disney travel guide that simplifies and organizes the podcast content. Join our community at patreon.com and search for Smart Moms Plan Disney Podcast. Joining our Patreon supports our woman-owned small businesses and allows you more simplicity and support in planning your next Disney vacation. Join us at patreon.com and we'll see you there. All right, everyone. Welcome back. I'm really pumped to talk about this next Kind of like an itinerary, right? Oh, yeah. So everybody has a Disney bucket list. Number one on mine is to see every Disney castle around the world. What is your y'all's number one Disney bucket list? I want to go on every Disney Cruise Line ship. Mm. I'll have many marked off this year. So jealous. That's so fun. Uh, You know, Disneyland for me was a big bucket list that I was able to experience this year. That was so fun. And I really would like to get over to Tokyo. But yeah, I mean, shoot, while we're dreaming, adding things on that bucket list, I'll see all those castles too. (laughs) That'd be great. (laughs) Seeing every Disney castle is not only my Disney bucket list, that's like life bucket list. You know, I really, it means a lot to me. I would like to do that. And I, I think I'll make it happen, but I have a lot to go. I will say though, the four park challenge was on my Disney bucket list. And actually, the six park challenge is also on my bucket list. And that's where you do all four Florida parks and then catch a midday flight to California and do the two Disneyland parks. And it is possible. People do it. And I swear I'm going to. But today we're talking about the four parks in Florida. And basically what it is, people kind of set their own guidelines and their own rules. But you have to, a lot of people will say you have to ride a ride and have a snack in every park for it to count. What What are y'all's criteria? So I've done the four park challenge. I fa- In fact, Part of you were with me for the whole four park challenge. <laughs> and for my my four park challenge, it was had to ride a ride, had to have a snack, had to take a photo with the icon. Those were uh, the parameters I gave myself. And mine was very similar. Just I had to make some type of purchase. I didn't necessarily have to have a snack at each one, but I had to buy something, something there to prove I was there. Yeah. So we did, my family went to Disney World for spring break as we do. And we won it. We were staying at the Beach Club, which for those of you that don't know, the Beach Club is a deluxe resort. It's in the Boardwalk Epcot area of Disney World. So it's situated right between Hollywood Studios and Epcot. And it has what I consider the very best pool on Disney property. And we really have been going a million miles a minute in my family and we needed some downtime and we just knew we're staying at beach club. It's such a fun place to be. The boardwalk is so entertaining. The pool is so awesome. So we knew we wanted to do a lot of resort time, but we couldn't go all the way down there and not go to the parks. And so my crazy wife and I thought, yeah, they're, they're big enough. We're going to just do one day of parks, but we want to see them all because you know, all the kids have different agendas and want to do different things. And so we decided to buy a single park hopper day. And we were just going to do all four parks in one day. And that's how we, that's when we did the four park challenge. And we had similar area, park icon photo and an attraction. We did buy something in every park, uh, but it really, we just wanted to make sure we rode something iconic and saw something iconic. And we did that. 
And we're going to sort of lay out an optimal way to approach this challenge. This was my second attempt at the challenge. I had to tap out when we were all together because I wasn't feeling very well. And so I only got to three out of four parks. It's devastating, actually. But it was really fun to complete with my family. So obviously, the first thing you're going to look at is the park order. And I think the order in which you do the parks can really vary. A couple of factors to consider. If you're a deluxe resort guest and it is a night with deluxe after hours, you have extra time in your day to complete the challenge. And you're probably going to want to end at the park with deluxe hours. If you're not a deluxe guest, the next thing to think about, are you an on-site guest? Because if you're an on-site guest, you get in to all of the parks early. So you're going to be able to add that little time. If you're an off-site guest, you can get this a little differently because you don't get any magic hours. So we're going to look at this specifically like you're an on-site guest. And when I went, Epcot was having extended evening hours. So we definitely knew we wanted Epcot to go last. What sort of things do you look at? I mean, when you're putting your parks in order. I always am going to pair Hollywood Studios and Epcot because of the parks They have so many different ways to get there. Did you know you can walk from Hollywood Studios to Epcot? You can take a boat. You can take a Skyliner. You could take a bus back to another resort and then walk in the back gates or the front gates of Epcot. There's so many ways to get between those two parks. It's just simply so easy to get between those two that if you're thinking about how to stack them, put those two together. Yeah, transportation is a big one. And we should actually mention, for those that don't realize it, in our Park Hopper conversation... All of the parks speak to one another through transportation. You can get from any park to any park. Most of the parks that take you from, you know, Magic Kingdom to Animal Kingdom or wherever you're going, you can always catch a bus at the bus corral. Or like you said, pairing with good transportation is really important. Is there a time limit for when the buses will start moving you from one park to the other? Yeah, I think it's like two hours after open. And there's usually, uh, you can find it in your My Disney Experience app or uh, just on the bus schedule. It will usually say when the park hopping buses start. It's not very late in the day. It You know, it, it starts pretty early. It's not right away. I mean, you can't stand in and then go catch a bus to another park, but it's fairly early after park open. So the parks that are connected, you know, Magic Kingdom and Epcot are connected by the monorail. Epcot and Hollywood Studios are connected, like Becky said, by boats or your feet or the Skyliner. So knowing that and mapping that to kind of minimize the use of buses, when we did our Fort Park Challenge and we got off our last bus, I was like, oh, we did it. We don't need a bus anymore. Like, this is amazing. And that felt really good to know that we were going to be able to just get to other parks other ways. Just adds another layer of fun. I don't necessarily recommend walking between Epcot and Hollywood Studios if you're trying to do this challenge because it does... Number one, your feet are going to need a break because you're going to be tired. And number two, it's a big chunk out of your day. You know, how long would you say it takes to walk? 20, 30? Probably about 30 minutes. And it's definitely not like Disneyland, California Adventure kind of walk. Oh. It's it's a good little walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say a good 20 or 30, which it's, it's actually not that bad. Like you may be hearing that and think, I mean, you can do it. We've done it, but I wouldn't do it on this day. So what we decided was Animal Kingdom was opening the very earliest that day. And Epcot had deluxe after hours. So we knew that those were our parks. We knew we wanted to buddy Hollywood Studios up with Epcot. And so that put Magic Kingdom after Animal Kingdom. And that's sort of how we went through and blocked out exactly what we wanted to do. But obviously, different circumstances would change that. If it's a Magic Kingdom deluxe after hours night, you would go there last. So really being mindful of park hours, really being mindful of where you're staying, that's going to help you order your parks. And then you're really going to want to utilize Genie Plus. So Genie Plus is going to help you get to the front of the lines. You can buy the Park Hopper all for park access and you can start a lot quicker that way. You're also going to want to take advantage of individual lightning lanes as well because you can schedule that a lot easier, Um, particularly the rides that, you know, if your ride of choice is Tron or Guardians, virtual queue may or may not work within your plans for what you have picked out for the day. So hopping on to the individual lightning lane first thing in the morning and and picking your time can be very helpful with that as well. I'm so glad you said that because we did that for Guardians. Guardians is the number one priority for my entire family. We all love it so much. And so right at 7 a.m., I was on that app And we knew we were going to be coming in the International Gate, which is the back entrance of Epcot and fairly far away from Guardians. And so I was trying to think through not wanting to run. And I was able to schedule a time and it ended up being, you know, absolutely perfect for us to get over there. And we were able to experience it. 
we weren't starting in in Epcot, obviously. So we weren't doing the virtual queue for Guardians. So it's a great point. Do you think that there's any possibility of using virtual queue in a four park four park challenge? Yes, we did. And I'll get to that later because because we were deluxe guests, we were able to. And I'll get there. Love that. Yeah. So we started at Animal Kingdom. We actually, this is just a fun little tidbit pixie dust story. We were leaving our resort and this day we were, we were soldiers. We were ready to rock. We were mobile ordering our breakfast. You know, I was doing our individual lightning lane. We were already out of the room at 7 a.m. dressed and ready for the day. We had our waters. Everybody had a little bag and we were off. We mobile ordered our breakfast and ate it right there. And we were planning to be at the bus stop by 10 after 7 the park opened at 7.30. So, you know, I thought that was a reasonable time. And as we were leaving our resort, somebody in the lobby said, oh, you all look so great today. Have a wonderful day. You know, just seeing us off. And we said, thank you. And he asked us where we were going. And I I said, we're going to do all four parks. We're starting Animal Kingdom. We're so excited. And he wished us well. We left. And not 30 seconds later, there he was coming out behind us. And he said, hey, wait one second. We turned around. He said, come with me. Let me take you to Animal Kingdom. And he was, you know, a cast member. That was just like a fun pixie dust moment. Not something you should count on, but I definitely thought it was worth a shout out because that's the kind of magic that happens. You know, we had this big day ahead of us and it was awesome. So we got there at Rope Drop. And if you're doing the four park challenge, Rope Drop is probably a really good use of your time, right? Is that what you all do? Yeah. Animal Kingdom is almost always, you could just count on it being the part that opens first. So doing that with your Early park entry, that's going to be the go-to. I can almost guarantee it, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think actually Magic Kingdom opened at the same time this particular day, which I thought was very odd. And it still did not Hmm. make sense for us to go there. And it's also important to say, you know, this four-park challenge, this is not for everybody. This is not your once-in-a-lifetime trip, unless you're like thrill seekers and adventurers in that way. But you're going to miss a lot of things. You're not doing everything at every park. Right. You know, and I think about people, I do get a lot of, questions about people who are already in Orlando for another thing. You know, we're a big volleyball family and there are a lot of volleyball tournaments down in Orlando and there'll be families who are like, we don't have a lot of time, but we really want to see Disney (laughs) for, you know, for just a little while. And this would be a great way to to do that. But yeah, you're definitely going to be missing out on so much of what Disney has to offer by doing it this way. But it is fun. Yeah. I think that starting at Animal Kingdom is a logical choice for multiple reasons. One, it always is among the earliest opening, if not the earliest opening. But also, it's bus transportation only or driving yourself there. And so for the purposes of getting your only option of bus transportation out of the way, starting there is an easy choice. Gosh, and we should mention driving yourself there. I think that's a terrible decision. Do not drive yourself there on a four-part challenge. Because you do not want to have to go back and get your car later in the day. You do not <laughs> don't want, do that. You do not want to drive to all four parks. You don't want to have to go back to Animal Kingdom at one in the morning and get your park your car that you left there at seven in the morning. <laughs> no. Think about how don't you would even it. get there. How would you get back to Animal Kingdom after the park is closed? You're gonna have to like Uber. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, yeah. terrible. Exactly. It's awful. So don't do that. And if you're planning on doing special experiences, you know, there's not going to be any Bibbidi Boppity Boutique. You're not going to the Harmony Barber Shop. Actually, for any Smart Moms travel agents listening today, the hidden Mickey will be Harmony. So you are going to want to know what attractions are open during your rope drop hours because it's not everything. And if you think you're going to run in and ride the safari, you're wrong because it's not usually open at rope drop. It's going to open right when the park opens. And so they're actually Animal Kingdom taking you all like pretty far left. And we went straight to Pandora, which if you're doing a bucket list ride at every park, Pandora is an obvious place to be. And we knocked out both attractions there in rope drop. So we rode Flight of Passage and my twins, who I've talked about many times on the show, who are, you know, pretty short, which I've also mentioned a lot of times on the show, they get that from me, which we need to post a picture of all the podcast team together on our Instagram because I am very short and I look just I keep looking at those pictures of us five and I'm just like really short compared to everyone. <laughs> I'm like barely coming up to people's shoulders. So my twins, you know, they're pretty small and they've never ridden it. They were finally tall enough. It was such an exciting way to start this big power pack day. They were tall enough. They rode that. We rode the Navi River. 
And by the time we were done with those two attractions, you know, rope drop time was just ending and we, we had a light, we got a lightning lane for the safari. And so we were able to just go ahead right there. And that was fantastic. We talk about the rules are that you have to have one ride, but in many of these cases, you're going to get more than one ride, especially if you're doing Genie Plus, because we need to also mention that if we're stacking rides, you can choose a Genie Plus selection in another park when you're not in there. So really thinking ahead, you can have opportunities lined up for you at your next location if you do this strategically. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did. I think that shows could also play into this. Different parks are going to have different types of shows. Animal Kingdom is a very show heavy park. And so maybe some people might include a show in there or a show instead of a ride, like lots of different configurations of how you could outline this. But it could also play into negatively For instance, if you walked into Magic Kingdom and a parade was going on, that's going to affect your time on getting into the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And we also, when we were designing the layout of our four parks, we considered the parade. We really wanted to see the parade. We loved the parade. We thought it would be a good break for us. And so we wanted to be in the park in time to see the parade. And that was going to count as one of the things we did in Magic Kingdom. So we had the lightning lane for the safari, rode that. We've talked on the show before about how the safari is the best in the morning. We were obviously very early among the riders and a giraffe came up to our safari car and almost put its head in the safari car. I have pictures we'll have to put on our social media of the giraffe's head. I mean, like a a couple feet from our faces. So cool. Yeah. And those are the kinds of experiences you can get anytime. But in the morning, the animals are just so up and so active and it's so beautiful. It was awesome. So we were getting ready to head out because that was everything on our list. And then I mentioned on a recent episode, the thrill ride episode that we just released, that my son is dying to ride the Yeti ride, the white monster ride, the coaster at Animal Kingdom. And so it dawned on me that if the twins were tall enough for Flight of Passage, they're probably tall enough for Everest. And so I I didn't want to say anything to my son. You you just never know. They barely made the cutoff. And I was like, let's just exit the park this way. We're going to walk all the way around. And we got up to the entrance of Everest. And I told my son, I was like, go stand, you know, go get measured for this. And they said he was tall enough. And my, my baby cried. He, his, he's like actually cried. He was pinching his eyes. And then I cried. Like, actually, I said, why are you crying? And he was like, can't believe I'm tall enough. And it was, he lived his very best life. We got to ride Everest. And we did all of this, you guys, before 930 in the morning. Awesome. Those are like the three big hitters in Animal Kingdom. Like, if I could go on Flight of Passage, the Safari, and Expedition Everest, that's an amazing day at Animal Kingdom. Oh, yeah. And we also did Navi River. Oh, my gosh. You really hit it. We And... And it was spring break. That's why I tell people, I'm like, you can do this. This was spring break crowds. And we knocked all four of those rides out. And I have pictures with timestamps. We were walking out of that park at 930 in the morning. That's amazing. Uh, I will say if getting a picture in the park is important to you, there is a really cool zoom in picture back by Expedition Everest that so many people walk by and don't realize that it's there. It's like almost a video picture that will start really, really close in, zooms out, gives you the full picture of Expedition Everest, and then zooms back into your family. It's know about those memory maker type of photos because there's so many awesome ones within the different parts. Yeah. And we actually did our icon photo on the backside of the Tree of Life. There's a really good photo spot when you're walking from the safari to Everest and it's the back of the tree and it's always empty and people can't stand in front of the tree from that angle because it you can't get to it. And so it's always empty and we have an awesome picture of the five of us. So that was great. And on our way out at 930 in the morning after doing all of that stuff, my son's crying. He's checking off bucket list items. Uh, the parrot show was going on. So we actually got to walk out of Animal Kingdom with McCall's flying over us. I mean, it was like the best way to start any day at Disney, but especially the four park challenge. That's so amazing. Super cool. Yeah. So we took a bus to Magic Kingdom, which is what you would do from Animal Kingdom. You're going to do bus to any from Animal Kingdom. There is no other transportation option. So bus to the next park. Ours was Magic Kingdom. We arrived at Magic Kingdom. We had a lightning lane for Space Mountain. And my son was so excited. And I know I keep mentioning my son, but it's because he's like my passionate rider. All of my kids ride. They all love the attractions, but he is his passion on these attractions. He could not wait to ride Space Mountain. Like he just tackled Everest. 
he is my only child that has not ridden Space Mountain because my daughter, my his twin, was tall enough at Halloween, but he wasn't. And he was going to be tall enough this day. So he could not wait. And he just kept saying, let's go to Space Mountain. Let's go to Space Mountain. And it was closed. Oh. Like it was down. You know how it goes down. So we were able to get the lightning lane earlier, but then it was down. And I was like, buddy, if it opens, we'll go. But it's down right now. And so what happens when your lightning lane window appears and the attraction is down is they give a park experience. So you can use it on another attraction. Has that ever happened to y'all? Oh, yeah. Often. Yeah. Which is actually sometimes good because maybe something was not available and you can use it. So it's it's a good way to handle when that happens. But when you have somebody that's so excited to ride Space Mountain, here's another reason why if this was just your once in a lifetime trip, the park hopper is good because it never opened while we were there. Yeah. We were at Magic Kingdom for quite a while and space was down the whole time we were there. And that was the one thing he wanted to do, you know. So we saw the parade. We took a nice rest. We rode Haunted Mansion with our multi-park experience pass. And it was, a, it was fun. But do you, I mean, what would you, what's your number one ride if you're in Magic Kingdom or what would be the thing you want to check off there? I would probably do Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't know why my family just loves Pirates best, but Pirates or... Haunted Mansion would probably be my two. So I had some mom guilt that morning because I actually did the virtual queue for Tron and I got it for my older daughter and for my wife and I, and we were just going to take turns with the twins. But when Space Mountain was closed and we had limited time and knowing that the virtual queue line is still a line, I just felt really bad taking that part time away from the twins who weren't going to be riding and space was closed. So we actually didn't use our virtual queue because I felt really bad, but we did. We did have it. And your timing worked for it, right? You got it right at 7am and your callback time was late enough and you get enough of a wiggle room in that, that it can still work. Yeah. Our call, we were called back while we were at magic kingdom. So it was, it would have been, it would have been perfect. And for some people, you know, that would have made the day even better, but just for people that are saying, why didn't you do Tron? That's why. Yeah. And as you just mentioned, you know, if you don't, if you are not aware, your virtual queue is not a, lightning lane at all it is still a line so you very easily could have an hour wait <laughs> when your call time is back so yeah i get it not doing that that's why you know the individual lightning lane is much faster it does take you to the front of the line so on a day like this if you're really wanting to hurry that individual lightning lane purchase is a smart one yeah definitely and i think i would have done that if i knew the twins were really tall enough it just wasn't something to focus on for us because of that that reason. And I, I sort of got the virtual queue as a backup, you know, and, and didn't end up using it. But would I have been judged if I had done the people mover as my one ride? <laughs> oh, you would not have been judged. I would have loved that. I actually was just thinking because McKenna and I are actually doing a four park challenge this weekend, which is pretty exciting. Oh, fun. She's the middle of my my babies and our oldest is graduating and I feel like she's going to be the star of the show for the next month. So I need to do something with my other two kids in the meantime. Aww. So we're going to go do that. Just the two of us, just the two of us this weekend. And I was thinking through Magic Kingdom because Magic Kingdom's not either of our favorite parks. What if we walked into Magic Kingdom, grabbed a treat of the confectionery and then hopped on the train, took the train around Magic Kingdom, got off of the train at that top of the train station, took a picture with the castle and been like, we're done at Magic Kingdom. Yeah, that's totally worth it. <laughs> I think so too. And I, Magic Kingdom is not my family's favorite park. I say it all the time. Even my three young kids, they love it. Yeah. And my youngest daughter in particular loves it. She's like the princess castle girl. And we all love to be there. But when asked, you know, what's your favorite ride or what's your favorite park? Usually that's not what they say. And so nobody had a lot of priorities there. And once Space Mountain was closed, we never went to Adventureland, Frontierland, or Tomorrowland. We walked straight back. We watched the parade from in sort of sort of um, across from Liberty Tree Tavern. That's where we like to watch the parade. There was some good shade. We got there early enough that we had a good spot. Got us got some popcorn and a Mickey bar. That was it. Yeah, we kind of left from there. Yeah, Magic Kingdom. I love Magic Kingdom. It's just not my favorite park. But that's not to say that it is not a park every single person needs to get to in their lifetime. No, everybody has to go. Yeah, it's yes, too you have to get there. For sure. When you're leaving Magic Kingdom, a good park to pick next would be Epcot because you can take the monorail over there. And I think anytime you can avoid the bus, it's great. Great circumstance. 
However, we had extended evening at Epcot, so we weren't going there next. We took the bus to Hollywood Studios. Again, this is really very based on where you're staying and, and what makes sense with park hours that day. For us, it made sense to go to Hollywood Studios, and we took our last bus for the day. And when we got off that bus, I was like, no more buses. This is it. We did it. Everybody was so excited to get in Hollywood Studios. That's, I think, my family as a collective, like all of us together have a lot of fun in Hollywood Studios. Our family loves it, too. There's so many thrill rides there. And as a family, we are a thrill ride loving family. So it it's just, I don't know. And not even just that. I can't even just say th thrill rides because we are going to watch the Frozen musical every single time we go to Hollywood Studios. This was the hardest park to keep our focus on. We're not here to do everything. Mm -hmm. Like skipping things in this park was the hardest for all my whole family because we did Tower of Terror, Rise of the Resistance, and we watched Beauty and the Beast, the stage show. And we had um we actually we ordered quick service from the Sunset Boulevard quick service locations, which <laughs> if you haven't listened to quick service dining at Hollywood Studios, give it a listen. Stacy loved the Sunset Boulevard shop. <laughs> Uh, but we ordered lunch from there and we rode Tower of Terror. We saw Beauty and the Beast and then we went back to Rise. But that meant that we were skipping Slinky Dog, Mickey Minnie's Railway, The Frozen Show. I mean, it was really hard to walk by all of that stuff. Yeah, that's difficult. I cannot imagine stepping into Hollywood Studios and not being there for, for Fantasmic. I have to end my night there. Yeah, that was tough too. But you know what? I walked by that thinking, it's okay. I'm going to go watch a great fireworks show at Epcot. I'm so excited. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> well, yeah, but I felt like we got a lot accomplished there, you know, and on our way out, Chip and Dale were just kind of meet and greeting and nobody was in line for them. So we actually even got a character meet in, which was really spontaneous and fun. And at that point, everybody was really dragging. So that makes it easier to walk out, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so then it was Skyliner over to Epcot. We were all dragging at this point and we got there in time. Perfect timing for Guardians and some festival booths. My favorite. Do you all like have a booth at certain festivals you can't wait to go? to? Always. And it, it's different for every festival. But of all of the festivals, I have to go into Canada during Food and Wine Festival. My what you, very. What do you get there? Uh, is it called the Apple Sky Blossom or the Blossom? I think it's called the Apple Sky Blossom. It's frozen apple juice and it has marshmallows on the top of it. It is, it's just my favorite. And it is such a great place to get out of the sun because that booth is inside where the normal Canada 360 show is. They close that show down for that booth to be in there. And it's just great places to lean against. Great, great drinks, great treats. Oh, it's just great. Yeah. Zan and I had to make the biggest sacrifice in Epcot because we really couldn't do World Showcase. Kids were very tired at that point. And they, although they love Frozen and Ratatouille, you know, most kids would say that's their favorite. My kids like Tower of Terror and Rise of the Resistance, <laughs> and we had already done those, and Guardians. And so we weren't super ride-focused anymore. My very favorite festival to any festival at Epcot is the the Street Corn. Uh, at, it's, I forget the name of the booth, at the Flower and Garden Festival, but it's covered in... Mm -hmm like garlic butter and this so good yes oh my gosh this like spice there's something that gives it like a kick it's a little spicy and it has a cheese on it i ate two ears of it and then they had like a gin cocktail thing that you could get with it i was in such heaven and the booth has moved this year so it was across from that really beautiful playground over by test track and so my kids met other kids and ran around for probably a half hour playing games all three of them so much fun we found a picnic table of all the luck. And I ate two years of that corn <laughs> and drank a gin drink while they ran. It was great. It truly sounded like you had like the most am amazing timing and magic moments happening in this entire day. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, they did have it in a different spot this year um, because of all the construction happening in Epcot. But we're so close to the end of construction, ladies. I can't wait. Oh. Have everything back. I'm so glad you said that because when we finished at Guardian's, so we fit when we finished at the playground is when we went to Guardians, our individual lightning lane. We had no w real weight because we had the individual lightning lane, which, if I do say myself, was perfectly timed for the day. <laughs> you know, I got like the greatest time. When we got out, it was dark and we walked to Center Park and my wife was like, oh, my gosh, did you know about this? And I had forgotten that the construction walls were down and that new lighting area in the middle of the park. Oh, it, it stopped me in my tracks because I forgot I was going to get to see it. I hadn't seen it yet. It's gorgeous. It is gorgeous. However, the new Walt statue in Epcot, one, 
I love the statue. I love that he's seated, that you can sit down next to him. Like, it's perfect. But the lighting at nighttime, do not try to take that picture at nighttime. Take it during the day. And I wish that they had planned a better backdrop because the building cuts off so much of the spaceship Earth. But I'm so glad we have another Walt statue. Yeah, it's really poor planning. If you, it was one of the pictures my family took for our challenge and we we had the cast member take it. And if you go to my Instagram, you can scroll. I look so scary <laughs> on my face. Like I like look evil because the lighting is like hitting all of my lines just perfectly. And I just, it's very bad lighting. Yeah, it's odd. They did not use a better, like a flash or something to to fix that. I, I don't understand that at all. Yeah, I wonder if that was a one-time thing with that photographer or if that's the usual. If you get that photo at night, it is not good. <laughs> I've taken it three times and every time I get that scary face. Every time. <laughs> that's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Just take it during the daytime. It'll be good. <laughs> yeah, but it is beautiful. And then, you know, we actually on the Skyliner from Hollywood to um, Epcot, We hit our virtual queue time for deluxe after hours because there is an evening virtual queue. If you're a deluxe guest at 5 p.m. I think six, maybe six. It will say in your app. And I think it actually may vary based on time of year and when the park's closing, to be honest. It's always good to check the app for times, period. But whatever time it was, we were on the Skyliner and I got our I got a virtual queue for Guardians, too. But to be honest, it was for after fireworks and we were beat. We didn't we didn't make it. I was bombed. I almost went back by myself, like even once we got back to our hotel room, but you know, we didn't do that. So we watched Luminous with Stacy, who was rever- reserving seats for a while for us. Well, not seats, just like a little area to stand in and watch that show. Regretted watching that show and not going to Guardians for a second time, <laughs> but did end our, but did end our day with fireworks. Yeah. I mean, it, it was not the worst way to end a day, but yeah, I just, I don't want to harp on it, but I was. I was disappointed. Yeah, we just kind of looked at each other at the end and we were like, did you like that? Yeah, it was really, it was so small. It just felt like, I don't know, it just felt really small and disappointing. There were some cool elements to it. It wasn't all bad, but it just was, I don't know, it just wasn't up to par. Yeah. I think when you're comparing it to Happily Ever After or Fantasmic, it definitely is not that level of like walking away with the inspiration to go out and change the world. But I I do think that if that's the fireworks you're going to see, if you only see those fireworks and you've never seen another Disney fireworks show, I think that the pull on Disney music and there's a little bit of storytelling to it and just getting, I don't know, something about the launching of those, I want to call them like rocket fireworks that they shoot off yeah. from around the thing. That hits pretty deep for me. Like that yeah. boom and having no, like, they're shooting fireworks, like, I don't know, 15 feet away from where I'm standing. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, there absolutely were some cool elements, for sure. Okay. You guys, for listeners that don't know, Becky cries on the three caballeros. <laughs> so do not take her word for it. This is not hit deep. This is silly. Okay. So being that we were staying at the beach club, this is why your resort choice sometimes is so important. My kids were zombies. I mean, we left our resort at seven in the morning. At this point, it's after 10 p.m., I would say. And my kids were so tired. We left Epcot, walked to the international gate from sort of that central area and walked to the beach club from end of fireworks to walking back to our resort room, changing into pajamas and my kids brushing their teeth. They were in bed and asleep. Total time. Take a guess. Gosh, I don't know, but I know I was in the parking lot in traffic trying to get out and you were sending a text saying with a picture of your kids that they were all already asleep and I was super jealous. So I know it doesn't, it wasn't very long. 20 minutes. Nice. That's amazing. From end of fire. You know, you're really good at this. Like the setup of where you're staying and your plan for where you're going, you you should consider being a travel agent. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we might have some good good advice to offer people. We Yeah, so 20 minutes, back to resort, teeth brushed, jammies on. The four-part challenge, it's so much fun. Like, now we have all, all can say we did it. We have these amazing memories. You guys still smile when you think about your four-part challenge days. Beck, what, what order are you going in this weekend with McKenna? So 
I'm going to let her be the driver of it because she is very minded like me in terms of wanting to be very strategic and thing that, things that she's doing. We know we're starting at Animal Kingdom. She actually does not love Animal Kingdom at all. So I'm sure she's going to be like, let's go in, right, flight of passage and leave. Uh, we'll probably go Animal Kingdom to Magic Kingdom to Hollywood Studios to Epcot or to Epcot to Hollywood Studios because there is a concert at Epcot that I want to see. And so depending on where we're at in the day is where we're going to um, depend on where we're kind of finishing. But I want to finish it at Hollywood Studios, but it's the Plain White Tees playing this weekend at Epcot. And so I was showing her and I played three songs. I turned open Spotify and was playing like, Hey there, Delilah. And and she's like, I know this music. I'm like, let's go watch it together. (laughs) Yes. Oh, they're so fun. Yes. We sound so old right now. Oh my gosh. I love Taylor Delilah. That was a great song. I know. So you should go. Well, you want to end with Fantasmic though. Or I could end with this amazing show at Epcot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You should go Animal Kingdom, Bus to Magic, Monorail to Epcot, Skyliner to Hollywood. I think that's probably what you'll we'll end up doing. Yeah. You'll only have one bus. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, doing stuff like that is so fun, figuring out how you're going to get from where to where and what are you going to ride. I mean, think about what we rode in a single day. I just feel like even if it was your only Disney trip ever, I mean, we did Flight of Passage, Navi River, Safari, Everest, Haunted Mansion, Saw Parade, Tower of Terror, Rise of the Resistance, Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, you probably hit just as many, if not more, rides in your exhausting day than some people hit in one day in one park without the crazy travel that happens there. But I also really love how you did this. You designed this and it outlines you can pack your day so full this way, but also how Park Hopper can kind of also give you the freedom to slow down and do things in a different way. It doesn't have to be exhausting like this. It can be anything that your family wants. Yeah. Yeah, totally. We kind of talked about the relaxing way to Park Hop and then this was like the extreme. (laughs) All right. We're quick break and come back and do a really fun lightning lane. Hey there, friends. I'm Katie Boone, one of your podcast co-hosts. I'd love to invite you to join my Facebook Disney planning community called Planning Disney with Babies, Toddlers, and Preschoolers. In my group, I love discussing all the aspects of planning your magical vacation with little ones. Find my community at facebook.com slash groups slash plan Disney with little ones. Again, that's facebook.com slash groups slash plan Disney with little ones. When you join, don't forget to tell me you heard about my group on the podcast. See you there. Hey, wait, wait, wait. I know you're ready to get back to the podcast, but I've got something very simple for you to do. Join my Facebook group, Disney Planning Made Simple. I'm Stacy, one of your podcast hosts, and I have a sweet, friendly Facebook group made for those of us who thrive in the simple pleasures of life. Things like family, food, and Disney. Join at facebook.com slash groups slash Disney Made Simple or follow with the link in the show notes. We'll be so happy to see you there. Okay, ladies, we're going to do a lightning lane if you were park hopping. I want fast answers. This kind of stuff puts such a smile on my face, like picturing being in the park and doing these things, doesn't it? You? Oh, yeah. Love it. Okay. Stacey, pick one ride in Animal Kingdom. Pandora. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. <laughs> Stacey, one ride in Animal Kingdom. A flight of passage, obviously. But if it was closed for some reason, I would 100% go to Expedition Everest. Yeah. Now Everest holds this place in my heart because my son mm. cried. Always going to be special. Okay. Pick one treat in Magic Kingdom. Becky. I was going to say popcorn. <laughs> I love popcorn yeah. everywhere, but a Dole Whip would be a second a second place for me. Stace, one treat, Magic Kingdom. I really like the brownie a la mode over at the anti- Gravity. Anti-gravity. There it is. I've never had it. Yeah. I think I'll get one of those apples, one of the really delicious apples from the confectionery. You know, I actually just tried jalapeno poppers from Frontierland at like this place called Westward Ho, and they were uh, awesome. I loved them. Hmm. Yeah. Your story on that on Instagram made me want to try mm-hmm. those. Okay. Stacey, if you were going to do two parks in the same day, which two parks would you park hop together? Oh, it would probably be Epcot and Hollywood Studios. Becky, same question. Uh, probably Epcot and Hollywood Studios, but I could also make an argument for Magic Kingdom and Epcot. Either way. Yeah. Anything that's uh, connected by something other than bus is always a good choice, in my opinion. Even better bonus if your resort is connected to one and you can even configure your order even better. I don't like when people say Animal Kingdom and Epcot because they're half-day parks mm. because it's not fairly true. 
Okay, one picture. You could take one picture in Hollywood Studios. Are you doing it in front of the Chinese Theater or Tower of Terror, Becky? Tower of Terror. Or somewhere else, or somewhere else, like the Millennium Falcon. Oh, Tower of Terror. There's some really great options in Galaxy's Edge, but you have to get the picture in front of Tower of Terror. Stacey? I agree. And I have one of my favorite pictures with me and my kiddos in front of Tower of Terror. So yeah, that's my first thought instantly. Find absolutely Sunset Boulevard, for sure. But I do love that Millennium Falcon picture. Okay, if you had one ride, pick one ride, Magic Kingdom, go. Gosh, I- we both want to say people mover. <laughs> I know. I definitely do. I definitely do. Oh my gosh. I, I would say my very favorite ride is definitely Haunted Mansion. So I would go Haunted Mansion. I might do Big Thunder Mountain just to have a little fun back there. I don't know. That's a tough one. Yeah. I would pick Thunder or Space for sure. I just like the thrills. That's why. All right. One picture in Epcot and Epcot has a couple iconic spots. What would you do? That's so hard because we are a get a picture at the colored wall at Disney Walls every time. And there's so many great walls in Epcot. Ah, uh, maybe the bubblegum wall. Oh, no, we probably would go do the picture in Japan that looks through straight at Spaceship Earth in the distance. I love that. That's so that is a nice yeah, one. That's- I like there's a spot where you are heading into World Showcase and you can do a selfie with if you time it right you can get the monorail and spaceship earth in the same background i love that yeah that's beautiful good call on that it's so funny the bubblegum wall is so iconic and everybody knows about the bubblegum wall but if if you've never been to it and you walk up on it it's like kind of hidden behind a wall it's very tiny and it's like five feet (laughs) it's like between bathrooms you know it's oh yeah it's yeah but the the toothpaste wall there's there's a lot of great walls in would you what's the best way to get from hollywood studios to epcot skyliner for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We were going to do, when we were doing our four park challenge, we were going to race because my wife really wanted to take a boat. And so my girls were going to go with her and take a boat. And my son and I were going to take the Skyliner and we were going to race and see, but it would have been so fun. I really wish we would have done it, but we were so tired. <laughs> we were just tired at that point. None of us had a, comp- uh, like a competitive bone left in our body. <laughs> uh, okay. One ride at Hollywood studios. Tower of terror. Oh, I'm going to say Mickey and Minnie's runaway railway. I I do love thrill rides and our family loves them, but Disney nostalgia pulls so hard on my heart. Mine is 100% Tower of Terror, but then I would feel really guilty for not riding rides. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, but I would pick Tower. Yeah, same. And final final Lightning Lane, pick one treat at Animal Kingdom. Ooh, that that's a hard one. I think maybe I would choose the giant pretzel in Pandora. It's pretty tasty. I picked the street corn, which if you haven't listened to our snack episode... Listen to that. See how the street corn did on our rankings. And that's actually where I was going to just because you had mentioned street corn and Epcot already. And I have not tried the street corn in Animal Kingdom yet. And so that was actually the first thing that popped in my mind is like, I've got to do that. Which of those two street corns is better, Ellie? Oh, can you tell I have a thing for corn, street corn? <laughs> um, oh, they're both so good. But I think I, my first answer is Epcot. I don't know if it's because I had it most recently or if it's because it's rare. It's not there all year, you know, but that I do like really anticipate that one in the spring. So I guess I would say Epcot, but I love all of mm. it. Love it. So fun. Such a fun conversation. I loved like kind of reliving my four part challenge and I hope it inspires people to like live their best Disney bucket list life. And we should talk more about Disney bucket lists because there are some really fun things that people try to challenge themselves with when it comes to Disney. And this is a really iconic one. If you decide to do a four part challenge, please take us along with you. Tag at Smart Moms Plan Disney Podcast while you're posting on social media. Ask us questions. Where should you go next? We should do a four part challenge and we should ask our listeners or maybe our Patreon community where we should go and how we should start and they should give us the snack and ride we should do. That would be so fun. Uh, if you're not already a member of our Patreon community, you can join that today just by checking out the links in our bio and maybe you'll be part of that challenge should we decide to do it we do all kinds of fun stuff over there so we'd love to have you join joining our patreon community really helps the podcast continue to be a good resource for all the families like yours trying to plan a trip to disney world hopefully you learned a lot about park hopping today and it inspired you to do some fun things with your family we hope that you are inspired after every episode of the smart moms plan disney podcast and until next time we'll see you real soon